Good morning, everyone. My name is Sri Harsha, and I will be focusing today on the optimizer module, uh, what is new in Fiverr 7 in the intro. So, we have uh, uh, two sessions in the evening about generated problems in JSON. So, I won't be focusing on the 5.7 part. We'll skip over to the 8.0. So, this is the standard safe harbor statement. Yeah, so I'll start off with invisible indexes. So a lot of times DBAs face this problem where they have a bunch of indexes and they have a bunch of queries. And they're not sure whether all my indexes are actually relevant or they're actually being used significantly. So one thing you can do, uh, so what happens is that one thing you can do is always drop that index, run your queries and say, okay, I have some indexes that are slowing down, you do an explain on it, and say that, yeah, that index would have helped, and then you have to recreate it. Now, recreating an index is always a very costly operation. So all you need to do here is, uh, so all you need to do here is convert it into an invisible mode, and then run your queries and maybe look at your explains and if that query is not and if that index is not being used then that's good you can just drop that index so this is like a dry run of dropping that index without <coughs> any real cost associated with it uh, next we have the descending index so even in 5.7 uh, you could say something like this where you could create a secondary index which was say a descending why is this useful um, Basically, if you have a query that has order by a descending. So there are two ways that the server will deal with it. One way is it will either do a backward scan in the sense that it will count from 10 to 1. Or it will bring all the data to the server and the server will do a file sort. Now file sort is doubly expensive because one thing is you need some temporary table type structure and you also need some computational uh, time. So it's very expensive. Instead, if you can just create this, uh, this sort of uh, A descending type thing, then you can just store all the values in a descending order, and it will just be a, a plain read rather than any sorting or anything required. Next, we have common table expressions. So to understand a little bit about common to understand a little bit about common table expressions, you need to know what are derived tables. So derived tables are basically that you have a subquery. So you have a subquery which is treated like a table in the sense that first, whenever you give a query like this, first this subquery is analyzed and it, the output is treated like a table with the name derived and then it is used for the rest of the query. So there are some drawbacks here which we will discuss. But with, sto uh, with uh, common table expressions, what you do is you bring that part out of the query, you write it, and then you have your actual query. So why? Well, first of all, there is better readability in the sense that you don't have to, OK, you have select start from, then you analyze this, and this part will be used outside. So all that kind of confusion is sort of gone now. Then uh, there are deeper problems that when you are writing derived tables, you can't do chaining like this. For example, you can't do a self-join like this, which is cell x star from t1 comma t1. You can't do that. You'd have to write the subquery all over again. So the query will become something like this. You'll have to say subquery derived, and the same subquery again and derived one. So even for a simple self-join type thing, you can't use it. So what will happen here is that this will be analyzed separately, this will be analyzed separately. So for the same subquery, you will be doing two levels of analysis. Instead, with the CTEs, that problem will go away. You can just say derived and derived. That's all. Self-joins become very easy. Then whether it's chainable, derived tables are not chainable. You have a subquery derived, but you can't do this. You can't write the derived table here. You'd have to actually put it in a CTE. So why are uh, recursive CTs good? So recursive, C 
So recursive CDs have basically two parts. The first is the seed part, and the next is the recursive part, in the sense that this will supply the first part of the value, and this will supply the rest of the values, and will go on until as far as it keeps going. So if you have used Oracle, maybe it's called connect by, and uh, the syntax is mostly similar to the one that MSSQL also uses. So if you have queries there, you can just port them. Now you have recursive CTEs, which are basically going from 1 to 10. Okay, you want to print values from 1 to 10, look at the last sentence. Select star from QN. Then you have QN. This is the seed, so the first value will be supplied here. And this query will run as long as this condition is satisfied. So as long as 10 is satisfied, you come down. Similarly, you have the Fibonacci values. So it's similar to printing 1 to 10. Okay, what is the real world example here? A real world example is that if you have a table which is basically very simple and you say you have an ID, you have a name and you have a manager ID, how do I create a reporting structure in the sense that okay, I report to my manager, my, my manager reports to a director, then VP, then the CEO. How do you get a structure like that? With normal SQL queries, that is not possible. You would have to use CTEs and you have to use recursive ones. So, look at. Uh, let's just go back and look at it here. The only person who has a null here is the CEO. So this guy John, he reports to uh, Yasmina, and similarly Pedro reports to uh, John, and John reports again to Yasmina. So that is the kind of structure we want. Now what you can do is you can write a simple recursive CTE where you have this structure. That is, you have the employees where the manager ID is null. So basically the first query, the seed query, will give you only Yasmina, who is the CEO. The rest of the guys will basically come from this query, which is a join of this CT. See, they explain, uh, the employees extended is the CT again, and employees is the table. And there is a join, and based on that, you'll get it. So you can see that John has 333 in the 190, which is basically their reporting structure. If you want to look at someone like Sarah, she reports to Pedro, Pedro to John, John to Yasmin. So just by simple concatenation and recursive CTE, you are able to accomplish this. Then you have improved uh, performance of scans. So what happens when you say select star from uh, the question? Mm -hmm. So uh, what happens when you say select star from? What we do in the server is we go to the storage engine and say, come on, I want all the rows that are in this table. What InnoDB does is that it goes to its own B3 and says, okay, do I get all the rows or do I get some rows? So initially it knows that it needs to get all the rows. So it will just bring in batches of four. Now what we are doing is we are saying, why bring in batches of four? Why do you want to traverse a B3 every time? Why not just bring in badges of much bigger uh, number? So what we do is we supply this guy with a buffer, the storage engine with a buffer, and the storage engine will bring that many number of rows. What is that number? Well, it will depend on some system variables that can be configured and the row size. So if you have a very big row, maybe you bring only 200 records at a time. If you have a very small row, maybe you bring 2,000 or more at a single time. So it basically saves you a lot of uh, fetching the time. What are the queries that will improve uh, its performance with this? Uh, normal table scans, which are basically select star from T. Range scans, which are basically, okay, I want all the values from 1,000 to 10,000. Maybe this earlier would take about divided by four, uh, number of rows divided by four, now it will take number of rows divided by 100 or 200. Also joins but only for the first table. The second table is anyway a rough access, so you won't really be helped by that. On dbt3, we noticed that with this feature, we have better performance for almost 18 queries, out of which two queries have shown around 15% improvement. So this is a standard dbt3 library. Hints. So yesterday we talked about force index. Uh, force index is also a hint, essentially telling that, okay, I want you as a query to use this particular index. 
there are other kinds of uh, ways of accomplishing similar things. So if you say, okay, you are not done. If you as a DBA feel that optimizer is not doing a good job of generating plans, you say this is not the best plan. And if I turn off this particular optimization, I will get a better plan. So what you do is you do a set with that optimization off for the optimizer switch. Then you run the query. Your, your job is fine there. But the problem with the optimizer switch is that it will basically affect all the queries that follow it. So you'll have to do a set, run your query, then do an unset. That is essentially two round trips extra to your server from your client. Whereas with hints, you give much more flexibility in the sense that it is part of the query and it doesn't have to even apply to the whole query. It can apply to a small sub-query or a particular table or something like that. So we have new hints in 8.0 which is join fixed order in the sense that if you say you have 10 tables, now what the optimizer does when I get 10 tables is I'll say, okay, I have to do a search of what is the best order. But it so happens that sometimes DBAs know what is the best order, so they don't want optimizer to spend a lot of time doing that. So they can just say join fixed order. Or you know that for a subset, it is taking a lot of time, so you just say join order. Similarly, prefix, suffix. How does it work? Yeah. So you have this query, and you have two tables, customer and order. If you leave optimizer to its own devices, it will do orders first, then it will do customer. But according to the DBA, they feel, okay, you know what, that's probably not a good thing. Maybe my data is continuously changing, or, you know, uh, optimizer somehow in this case is not doing a good job. Good. Just say join order, just put this much, you put the customer table first, order table next, you get customer, order. That's it. So, in your case, we put a uh, force index here. This will be a new fusion. Uh, this particular syntax will be new? Yeah. It's an A.0. So, this is an A.0? Yeah, this is an A.0. It's already the labs version is out. Also, oh, prior to this, there was no optimizer uh, <coughs> in join order. Join this order. Uh, well, there was something called uh, straight join, but straight join didn't give you much flexibility, in the sense that if you had five tables, all the five tables order was specified in that order. Whereas with join order, let us say you had a third table, uh, something else T3, you can say that for customer and orders, I want this order. But the third one, I don't care. You can put it front, back, anywhere. So it's a little more granular. Yeah. Similarly, a lot of times when we have derived tables like this, you will try uh, optimizer will try to merge it into the rest of the query in the sense that we'll break up this uh, we'll break up this whole query. We'll send the table out and we'll say join T1, join T2, and then do this. Maybe in some cases that is not a good thing. And the DBA can just say, OK, I don't want this merge. You can just say no merge. And we won't do the merging. So the table will still, the subquery will still be preserved. Better UUID and IPv6 support. So UUID is a standard uh, value that is generated that is across, that is unique across uh, platforms, machines, time zones, everything. Um, so the problem here is that it's very big. The first part indicates the hours, minutes, and seconds. The next part indicates uh, the days, and then comes the months and years. So when you want to store it, you either have to store it either in a blog or in a big back app 36, which is not very ideal. So a lot of people, what they do is they break up this UUID, they remove these extra dashes, and they just store it in binary 16. But as you know, you'd have to write a very big store procedure to it, maintain that store procedure, things like that. Now you don't need to do that. You can just say UUID to binary, and binary to UUID. And you just give your value, get the value. And you can also check the validity, is UUID. There is another advantage here. Notice that in my previous slide I said the seconds come first. Now, if you want to create an index on something, 
having second spot doesn't really make sense because then your data is not meaningfully contiguous. So if you want something to be meaningfully contiguous in the sense that you want it, the you want the years to come first actually, this part. So all you have to do is you add it to binary with an extra argument, and that is done. So once this is this part is done, you can store it in a binary 16 and then index that value. And your data will actually be continuous. So any data is sort of continuous, but it's meaningfully continuous here because it is a timestamp written. And similarly, you have this bin to UUID with the extra argument. Why will these be important? Because a lot of times customers and users come back to us saying that we have these huge uh, stored procedures that we've written just to do this particular function or just to write this particular function. So we just want to create an index. Can you create a reliable way of doing it? And this is the way. <coughs> IPv4 and IPv6 support. So IPv4, these values are generally stored in uh, big int. And when you apply a mask on it with an AND value, it works fine. But when you have IPv6, this is generally stored in a binary or a blob. And binary and blob are not supported for um, AND, that is bitwise operators. So you would get incorrect results. A lot of times customers would just write uh, multiple stored procedures just to break up this value, then do the AND and then return it to themselves. So now you don't need to do that. You can just say these bitwise operators are supported for both binary and block. So and, or, all these will be supported. What is the future roadmap? Well, in the afternoon, we have some sessions about JSON. So you can ask questions about the advanced JSON functions. Then he will be here. So he's the main person doing that. The cost model improvements in the future, histograms are coming in with uh, also we start distinguishing between data in memory versus disk. So the cost model will take into account whether the query is used a lot. Then there are windowing functions, which is also a popular feature. Improved statement for the improved support for prepared statements. You can say prepare. The optimization part will be done. And when you say execute, from there on, only the execution part will be done. So that you won't be spending time deciding the join order. Uh, should I use range access, ref, uh, ref access? Should I use this index, that index? All that will be gone. You just do an execute. The query will go directly to execution. It's already there, but a lot of the optimization still happens in the execute part also. We'll move it completely to the prepare part. There is the optimization for GIS operations. So a lot of support for R trees, which are used for GIS, and also a lot of uh, new GIS functions that are part of the SQL standard. So these are the features. <coughs> so any questions? I have a question. Thank you. Uh, in some databases, you can store the optimizer plan of the query. Yeah. So next time the QD will run, it will fetch this. Uh, it will run according to that optimizer plan. Uh, it will not calculate again. So is this uh, something available in MySQL? It is available to a certain extent already. You can say prepare run your query. So a lot of the passing part. In five point seven. So five point seven. Even in five point six. Okay. You can say prepare the passing lot of the semantic analysis. That sort of thing will be done. So if you want to just say, does this query even work? You can just say prepare. And when the execute part comes, a lot of these passing part, that will not happen. Okay. Some optimization parts still happen, like the join analysis. Okay. But from 8.0, it will be even more. The walls will go up, saying okay. only the execution will happen. In 5.7, it's still useful in the sense that if you have very big query with an in with 100 values, uh, you don't need to go through whether each value is correct <coughs> every time you execute the query. You can do that in the prepare execute phase. Like Thank you. Uh, I have a question on the recursive CTEs. Yeah. Uh, just I gave an example of the organization where the CEO, manager, yeah, yeah. employee. So, uh, what's the um, how expensive is it in terms of like performance on memory? If you have let's say 
very large organization with many levels and right, right, right. one other question is uh, when you query are you able to query like certain parts of the the, the tree or something like that so okay so the first question i got and you're saying let us say we have a company like oracle which has yes hundreds of thousands of employees uh yes it will be expensive second of all you're doing a union all i mean the recursive city anywhere is based on a union all so union all is always expensive in the sense that you might have to use some temp tables uh, internally the server will use some temp tables um, it is expensive in the sense that yeah earlier you were not even able to do something like this and now you are able to in this you would have to know the depth of your organization structure earlier to write a very big query but now at least in terms of this it's useful and uh, the temp tables are pretty much optimized in the sense that there won't be more than one temp table created per layer. So for example, for John and Tarek, they're both at the same level, right? Mm -hmm. So to generate their records, one temp table will be used. So when going to the next one, another temp table will be used. And there is some repurposing of it. So it won't be very costly still. The, the temp table I can use uh, like a memory base instead it, of it, yeah yeah you see uh, so if it's a small one it's generally on the heap and in memory but if you have a very big uh, temp table which is created it might be flushed to inodium okay yeah yeah is there a such thing as a SQL profile or a SQL baseline in, in my SQL? I'm, I'm sorry I don't know what that uh, is I, I, I'm an Oracle DBA I'm thinking of um, this uh, performance tuning. Is there a such thing as SQL profile um, or baseline or, or yeah, if you run something with the query and oh, yes. that's performance schema. That is the performance schema. We have a session on that also. Okay. So you can monitor what is happening on the query mm -hmm. or which particular phase it has spent a lot of time. Okay. Sometimes it so happens that the query itself, the execution is very small, but choosing the join order takes very long. Because you had some pen tables, we had optimizers spent an inordinate amount of time just choosing the join order. So that you can get from performance. Any questions? Any other questions? You referred that you sometimes we use temporary tables of inordinate. Yeah. yeah. Which version did we do that? It's, it's there in 5.7? Uh, it is there in 5.7. And uh, what happens is that uh, the temporary tables in InnoDB, you can actually tinker with it in the sense that uh, by default it uses the one, the temp tables on the heap. So it tries to create a temp table on the heap. And if that size exceeds beyond a point, it will flush the temp tables to InnoDB. But in 5.7, you can set a system variable which will basically never use the heap, it will go directly to InnoDB. Okay. So, the heap we do not let it expand beyond the point. So, Edu.to does it more intelligently? I mean, does it more intelligently for CTs. Okay, okay. For CTs. Okay. For other queries, there are minor improvements which are bug fixes, but there is no feature there. Okay. So, any other questions? So actually, it's going to be able to ask, uh, I have a question, uh, director that uh, sent you, which I forgot to ask. Why, why the version jump from, uh, from 5 to 8? If I remember, is uh, is this 6 uh, supposed to be the development version? Yes, yeah, so we had, uh, we, we've been at 5 for such a long time. So it was always 5.5, 5.6, 5.0. So there was a 6.0 that we had planned, and that 6.0, uh, you know, there were just too many things that we had done there and we kind of lost our way with 6.0 so we decided okay we will take pick the best features put it into 5.6 and 5.7 so 6 was not possible because people will get confused 7.0 is used for the MySQL cluster which is our you know uh, in memory database cluster with automatic rebalancing and everything so then 7 was gone and then we said okay it's going to be 5.8 let's call it 8.0 and then we have more, you know, possibility of making it 8.1, 8.2, and then 9 and 10 and I don't know. 
Oracle is at 11, right? So they say, okay, why, why don't you want to have major numbers? Is it 12 going or 13? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So we should have bigger numbers. People, people feel more that we are doing more innovation if the numbers are bigger, right? So, I don't know. They so start feeling that they might go to 108 for a large yeah. Just numbers. Uh, Harsha, uh, I have a question on the on the pen table. So in in, in my SQL, in for the pen table, pen table happens can happen for each transaction, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. It, it will be it can be generated if the transaction meets the time table. But then uh, would we be able to uh, is there any any way to limit the number of time tables? Limit the number of time tables mm -hmm. I don't think so. Number of time tables I'm not sure. But um, you can limit the size of each time table. Yeah, using the ten table size. And yeah, ten table size. Table so table you size. can set it to a minimum of one zero two four, or you can set it to a very good value. Okay, so so basically the the num the this we will have to adjust. Uh, we will have to calculate the the, the RAM for this server yeah, based yeah. on the number yeah. of this uh, the max hit that probably <coughs> will be needed based on the number of transactions yeah. that. The, the other problem with having a very small size of temp table is that you keep creating more of those and, and each temp table will have its own small metadata and all that. There's a small overhead in terms of saving that temp table. So, so if you set it very small, even that can explode. So is that resizable? The data files, I mean, like in the Oracle database, it could be resizable. Then they will space. Yeah, that is resizable, okay. but not on the fly. That's not on the fly. Yeah, when a query is running, you couldn't resize it. So you have to, once the query is done, or for the next query, you have to All right, thank you. One thing to mention, the last point, you mentioned that there is a overhead to create the metadata, right? That's gone after the introduction of data dictionary. Oh. So we don't, we don't, Persist the metadata on the disk now. It's just in the server. Yeah, memory. the thing is that uh, Oracle support has this advisory that says don't have a temp table size that is very small. Mm -hmm. Because uh, maybe it's not just metadata, maybe yeah. okay. other internal structures that we maintain which can also be in the Thanks.